record and we're rolling. So here we are, Psychedelics Today, Joe Moore and Kyle Buller, and we are here to talk today about consent and ethics. So Kyle, hello. Hey Joe, welcome everybody. <laughs> so consent, let's dig into what consent is. Um, to me, consent is really laying out a story about you know, what you're asking for and asking then for permission. Um, say you want to give somebody a hug, maybe it's a little intense to just go up and hug them um, for whatever reason. There's a lot of reasons that could be the case. And they say, I'm feeling drawn to give you a hug. Is that okay? And then the person says, okay, then it's okay to give them a hug. Otherwise you just kind of walk away and, you know, be okay with the no. <laughs> um, don't be pushy, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, in the breathwork world, yeah, we talked about a lot of this stuff in breathwork, um, kind of largely um, doing informed consent around like, you know, the whole pos the whole range of experiences that you could have. Um, that's a little tricky because it's just words and you're dealing with possibly tran very transcendent experiences. Um, but the more realistic just talk track for breath work is around body work because mm -hmm. not everybody wants body work. Not everybody feels safe with body work. Um, so you want to really like lay out the story ahead of time and then afterwards too about what, what that could look like. Um, I miss anything there. No, I think, um, I think that's about, you, you covered a, a lot of that stuff. And yeah, I guess I would just say like, I, I guess I view consent as providing information about whatever experience that is. So if it's breath work, providing an experience, what breath work could be, but then also providing like the, um, the, the limits of breath work or say if we're work if, if it's psychedelics like actually kind of out outlying the limits of it and potential risks and dangers um so somebody that's going into this practice or breath work they're getting a full scope of what they could expect and what not to expect um because i think it's so easy when we're dealing with these things to kind of I don't know, make these grandiose uh, expectations of, you know, this will heal you and this will do this and this will do that. And to kind of be realistic about it and say, you know, it has the potential to, but it's, it, it's not always the, the case. Um, and then, yeah, also going, I mean, the big thing with us in, in breath work is body work. And that's a huge thing where, you know, we really have conversations with the people about doing body work and the body work is mostly, it's a, it's a relationship process. Um, you know, the facilitator is doing something, but it's really the, the participant doing and asking for permission and having that voice to say, I don't want, want, want to do this anymore. You know, it's, we're not in this expert role where you need to have this done. Um, so it's a participatory thing too. It's like a 50% effort on both sides. Uh, mm -hmm. We try to match your effort. So that, that kind of helps too. It's kind of a built-in safeguard for consent and not going too far. Um, that's one of the benefits of a method designed by psychiatrist or a psychiatrist and refined over the years, probably with a number of them. But one, you know, one um, fault we're seeing in the psychedelic world um, <clears throat> is a lack of consent uh, for, for a number of things. So, one issue I've heard of is um, you're about to go smoke DMT with somebody who says, hey, let's go smoke DMT. And um, all connotations are that you're about to smoke NN DMT, the most common form of DMT that you've heard everybody talk about from Joe Rogan, Terrence McKenna. You go, okay, that sounds reasonable. I can, I could probably handle that. And there's no real serious psychological fallout. Odds are that there's no fallout from your first time. You never know. You're rolling the dice anyway, but um, instead of NN DMT, they bring out 5-MeO DMT from the Bufo alvarius toad with the bufotenine toxin in there, which, you know, both bufotenine and 5-MeO could, you know, have some cardiac issues. You, you really want to look into that. Um, it's the equivalent of saying, hey, could I have some ibuprofen? Uh, and then they give you like 20 milligrams of oxycodone instead. Um, and they don't tell you what it is. And that's, that's not okay. Um, it's really not okay. The order of magnitude of intensity of these 5-MeO experiences seems off the charts relative to all these other psychedelics we, we know about. Um, and that really could cause uh, 
very traumatic experiences for people. And I, I think the, um, you know, for, for a lot of folks, it's incredibly wonderful, but for a, a larger portion of experiencers with 5-MeO have a hard time, I believe, than, than with NN. And it's just not okay to swap out drugs. Um, you know, here's, you know, here's uh, some acid, but in fact, it's like a whole bunch of ketamine and you don't even know. Like, it's not okay. Um, I don't know. Any, any comments on that? I haven't heard the um, swapping out of DMT to 5-MeO, but I guess that's probably pretty reasonable to think about. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, some of the uh, Colorado people are um, mm -hmm. seeing that happen more than once. Mm -hmm. So the other, the other thing, I guess, is around physical safety. Um, again, in breath work, we have this really great model that we're doing, you know, legal psychedelic work through breath and music and other things. But, you know, we want to be extremely safe because it's risky to bring people into these states sometimes. So one of the major risks is hitting your head or physical injury from, you know, being too close to other people and you're getting like really moving around a lot. Um, one thing I saw in some videos of 5-MeO facilitation was people standing um, and or being forced to stand when they smoke the drug. Um, it seems like people in that world consider that feeling of falling to the ground really beneficial um, and being supported you know, by facilitators. But um, I've seen other facilitators not be that careful about people falling. And then, um, you know, okay, so head injury risk is a big deal. Um, as people age, their bones become less uh, strong and you could get a hip break or a leg break or something, or even a back break from somebody falling even onto their butt. And uh, I think that's really not okay. I, I think that to me falls under the category of unsafe facilitation, unless you're taking very extreme precautions, which I haven't really seen yet in video um, for that particular thing. Um, yeah. I guess I have a hard time, I guess, making like a generalization like that. Cause I've only seen those videos. I've never seen any facilitators do that stuff, but, yeah. um, I don't want to say everybody's doing it. It's just a couple of the, the bigger names out there doing that kind of thing. And I, I think that's not okay. Yeah. And, you know, I, I want to come back to this topic. Um, like what is actually psychedelic informed consent? We had this conversation, I, th I think it was in one of our master classes for our navigating psychedelics course. Um, was it with Larry? I think it was Larry, somebody from Erie. It was either, it was either Julie Megler or Larry. Yeah. Um, but when, you know, you're signing up for, to do any of this work, could be breath work, could be doing psychedelic work, whatever that is. Like, do you really know what you're signing up for? And how, how can you really know? And I think coming back to what Joe was saying, it's like such a wide range of experience. Um, like on paper, you might know, oh, this might happen, this might happen. But I mean, once you're in there, you know, it's, a, it's a totally different story. So it, it, it is kind of interesting, like what is like informed consent in the psychedelic experience? I mean, is that even possible to, to have some sort of informed consent um, to really like embody the whole experience and what could be expected? Um, yeah, the reality of something is much different from somebody like Terrence McKenna saying words or words on paper like the experience is a very different thing it's like that map is not the territory deal um and i guess i, I don't know how serious of a deal that is I, I i think as long as you're taking serious time to let them know like the words on the page are not what you're experiencing you're experiencing the thing we're talking about which isn't equal to those words but it, it's it's hard to get that philosophical sometimes with people yeah but i, I think it's important to like hint at it a little bit or at least explicitly state something like that um definitely yeah it's a complicated subject and i think uh to be cavalier about psychedelic use is um ethically risky and uh you know if we want to be as ethically upright as possible like let's let's have hard conversations and spend the time talking before we jump into doing this kind of more serious work yeah and i think this conversation is difficult to talk about because 
I mean, when you're talking about ethics or um, consent, you're talking about something that is still legal in the United States. Um, so, you know, this could really bleed over into legal work, which is probably a little bit easier to talk about. But, um, you know, what are like consent or ethical boundaries for people doing this work in the States? I mean, obviously they're taking a risk, but then how do they show up to the work and what's the integrity behind it? Um, Cause I think like that's, we're starting to see some, some things emerge from that of maybe not having integrity or showing up and not knowing boundaries, not knowing like that relationship or how to give consent or any ethics around it. Um, and, you know, you, you, you probably definitely see that in, in places overseas as well because um, of different cultural backgrounds and norms. Um, so it, it, it's a really tricky tricky topic to, to navigate, but I think it's also important to, to bring up and talk about because you know, there's, there could be a lot of harm and, and danger. Um, <clears throat> so two other behaviors before we jump on to the next subject that I've seen in these videos is, um, well, three, three behaviors. So it's, a, it's one thing if you get permission beforehand, but if you don't get permission beforehand and you do these three things to somebody while they're high, um, it, it, to me, that's a serious um, breach of trust and protocol and ethics. So number one is non-consensual use on somebody else of rape snuff, which is like a really serious tobacco snuff, um, sometimes mixed with other herbs probably, but it's, you know, forcing, forcing a very intense drug into somebody else's nose without them saying, yeah, sure. I would like to do that. Um, and without really running it by them beforehand, even before they've touched the drug. Another one is the use of an electrical taser device. Some of you have probably seen this video out there, 5MEO facilitator using a taser on somebody non-consensually to force them to stand up um, because this facilitator believes standing up is very critical when you're high on um, 5MEO. Uh, another one is a bucket of water getting splashed in high people's faces. Again, you know, getting permission beforehand, it makes it a little more okay. I think it's a little harsh, but get permission before you do this kind of stuff. Otherwise, you're, you're stepping into very dangerous territory. And when people are under the influence of psychedelics, their psyche is far more delicate than you might imagine. And anything you might do to um, interrupt that c could cause very serious, long-lasting harm. So... Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, let's take a playbook here from the doctors, um, the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. Mm -hmm. you know, in the psychedelic world, it doesn't seem like that's always the case because this stuff does carry risks, but um, start with the intention of doing no harm and, and, and go from there, hopefully doing substantial healing work. Yeah. And I think part of that too is um, like, yeah, obviously knowing what you're getting yourself into um, asking and maybe questions. The, asking questions. And I think like, you know, this just might come from like, um, like a counseling background or, or just doing breath work. But like, I, I really come from that background that like, you're the expert and uh, you, you know yourself best and to be able to have a say in your own process and to say no, if you know, you're dealing with somebody with more power or authority and, and they want to um, intervene with some sort of technique or skill, I feel like you, you do have the right to say no. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like sometimes maybe we don't realize that because we're in a vulnerable position where we're seeking healing and we kind of project that onto somebody and say, well, they're the healer, they, they know what's best for me. But, you know, I, I really come from that background that you, you know yourself the best and you may know what you need and what, and what you don't need. And granted, you know, that might be a generalization, but, and sometimes he, uh, doctors or whatever might know better depending on, on their education or, or what their expertise is. But I feel like, you know, you should always have the right to say no to something if that comes up. So I don't know if you saw this a while ago, I think it was like a few months ago, uh, soul quest down in, uh, Florida some some young person died there and mm. uh, n I don't think there's been like an investigation disclosed yet but um, there is I guess uh, <clears throat> like 
suspicion that that it could have been um, comboed during the ayahuasca ceremony. Um, so, I mean, nobody really knows. I'm just tossing this out there that like a combo, because you brought up Ape and stuff during the session, but th this is a situation where it was like, were they under the influence of ayahuasca and then they had combo during the session, which, you know, that sounds could be potentially pretty dangerous. Um, did That's they like know that? Yeah. Did they know what they were getting themselves into? I don't know. Like, like I said, this is just like suspicion. So I'm not really trying to, <laughs> you know, say this is what happened, but um, it, it's, it's just a, you know, something to think about that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the informed consent piece there is like, not many people are doing this. Probably people are, but we don't know too much about how safe this is. You know, what we do know is mushrooms are safe. Acid appears safe. Ayahuasca is very safe. Um, Ibogaine's a little risky. Um, ketamine's super safe. So, you know, as long as you're not in a float tank by yourself unsupervised, uh, you know, <laughs> There's, there's things that are safe and there's things that are dangerous and we need to put those on some sort of harm scale that we judge for ourselves. Like, is that risk worth it for me? Like, is there, is it worth doing combo and ayahuasca at the same time? I think we don't know the answer to that. I would say no until we get some data that would prove otherwise. Um, even if there's one shaman in Ecuador doing this stuff all the time, like, does that make it okay? I don't know. If we need a larger sample set, probably a, at least a lightly controlled study to, to mm. figure that out. Um, so yeah, that's a big deal. I didn't know that story. I don't know how I missed that. You know, it, it was really interesting because I, I saw it pop up on Facebook and then I tried to Google search it like a few months, like, or like a month later and I couldn't find anything. I had to go back and, and find the thread on Facebook. So, um, you know, I don't know if there's been an official report that came out of what happened, but, um, you know, I just thought it was interesting uh, that that happened and there was some, you know, discussion around what, what happened down there. Could it have been like somebody using combo while they're in session. Um, and like I said, nobody knows yet. So I don't want to make this like a rumor <laughs> or anything, but. Um. All right. So now for the hard talk. <laughs> so we started off with consent. Um, you know, consent is clearly kind of a, a more sexual discussion. It's less about hugs and more about sex and drugs. And um, at times people, do non-consensual sexual things. Um, and it's, it's complicated. And that happens inside the psychedelic world, um, probably more than we want to admit. Um, I've, we're in a weird position because a lot of people come to us and ask us to like kind of intervene on stuff or out people or help them. You know, sometimes we'll help. Sometimes it's like, this is a little tricky. I don't know what to do here. And and um, Kyle and I are in the process of really sitting with a lot of this stuff and figuring out what the, the most ethical thing is and what's the best thing for us to do. Um, you know, not only for ourselves, because we have to be concerned about ourselves, but also for others in the community. Um, we clearly don't want others to get hurt, but uh, you know, it's something we got to think about. So when someone's high on psychedelics, it's quite easy to suggest certain things to them that, that would lead towards sex or, other inappropriate acts. And um, as soon as someone consumes a drug, consent is kind of out the window. Mm -hmm. um, there was this South Park. I, I don't know if you've been, <laughs> I love South Park because it's like actually, as it's making fun of something, there's just so much truth there too. And there was this um, fraternity called like PC bro. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like politically correct bros. And they're all wearing like the, uh, the nerdy Oakley kind of like small glasses and like, say bro to each other a lot and you know when they would have a frat party and they'd have all these ladies over they would have actually signed consent forms um before sex and then actually like they had a person go around and collect the consent forms before it was okay um and like double signatures triple checking you know the the misnomer there is they didn't sign these consent forms before drinking or doing drugs or whatever so consent as like a, a thing is kind of out the window to me, it feels really like as a guy, it feels really risky um, because this is such like, like we've been doing this kind of behavior for thousands of years. It doesn't make it okay, 
what it does make it is quite complex for us to navigate. Like after two beers, is it okay to um, meet somebody at the bar and, and go home with them? Like legally in, in some places that could be considered rape. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying it's scary. Um, and uh, it's a, it's a complicated issue that we have to negotiate and, um, and evolve and grow with because this is, this is new information for most American dudes and probably international folks as well. Like it would be interesting for me to talk to some Europeans and get the European perspective on this too. Um, because I, I'm not a hundred percent sure it would be the same attitude mm. or even Australians. Australians are far more cavalier as a, as a whole um, from what I understand than Americans. Um, but I don't know any, any comments on what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm trying my best not to be offensive here. I'm just kind of like making observations and, yeah, no, it, this is a, a tough topic to talk about. Um, and I, I think that is important. Any type of interaction that you might have with a facilitator or somebody that you might be doing this stuff with, maybe it's just a friend, um, like get some consent beforehand, like lay out like some rules and, you know, sounds kind of maybe professional, but, you know, it, it's helpful um, if you are going to do something like this together. Um, to kind of just talk about like what, what feels safe, what doesn't feel safe before, you know, you ingest something. Um, because like, yeah, when you're in that experience, it might be like really great. And then afterwards you're like, what just happened? I'm sure, you know, there's probably some people that had those one night stands and then in the morning they're just like, what the hell did I just do? In the moment it seems, seems like really great, but um <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's tricky. And you know what, I don't know, something that you brought up actually has been coming up a lot in my practicum with, you know, the, this uh, definition of, of rape, I guess you would say. Um, you know, there, there have been some uh, people that, that talked about, like, quote unquote, being in a relationship and being raped. And that they would say, like, you know, most people wouldn't define this as that, but I feel like it was because I, I kind of said no to it. But since we're in a relationship, you know, most people would just say, well, you just, that was with your partner. <laughs> um, and I think that really comes back to like this idea of like respect. Um, you know, even though you might be in a relationship, if somebody says no, that means no. <laughs> uh, no does mean no. Like yeah. that's, that's the one thing we do understand. And um I'd like to encourage a lot of folks to um, engage the authorities more. Like there's, you know, we're paying taxes too here guys and we deserve police protection. So if there's somebody out there who did something and um, you know, if the right move is to go to the police for you, you know, consider it like they're, they are the, the accepted authority figures around this stuff and, and getting their help is okay. Um, just because you did drugs doesn't mean that they're going to discount you. Um, I think that's where it gets tricky sometimes is that, you know, in, in the United States, it's still legal in many other countries. And so how do you, if something that you felt like you were harmed or, you know, abused or assaulted during an experience, like how would you go to an authority figure and, um, you know, state your case? Because, you know, you're also kind of stating that, you ingested a substance and so that, I think that's what makes this conversation so tricky around ethics and boundaries and consent in this world is that you know it's the laws but I read this book recently called Missoula by John Krakauer and it's all about rape in America rape culture and um, it used this town that people assumed was the rape capital of America and turns out it's below average um, in terms of numbers of rape and in the final analysis and after a lot of really tragic stories being told and laid out in the book the, the long story short is the justice system in America couldn't be designed better to leave victims more traumatized than when they started the process. Um, it, it, there's so much room for, uh, hurting the victim again and again and again. And that's one of the main reasons why, um, people don't report too. So it's, you know, it's understandable if you don't want to go to the cops, but, you know, consider it like it, maybe if you see, you know, a few other victims from an individual, maybe you go forward with the police together. Um, 
it's harder to dismiss multiple people and multiple claims and individual claims. And, you know, maybe the police aren't going to throw it out and, you know, maybe get a lawyer too. Like it's, so police will often just throw out cases and say, Oh, that's unwinnable when that's not at all the case. Um, and a lawyer could really help through that process and, um, really help individuals. Uh, so where do we go from here, Kyle? I don't know, but that, that brings up something interesting that I came across like doing, you know, more counseling work. Um, at this, the place that I'm, I'm at, they were saying that if like somebody like reports some sort of sexual abuse, you could obviously report that to the authorities if they wanted to. But in this setting, you know, it's at a college and um, it, it's so hard for them to, to follow through with it because it's, um, you know, it's like, what, what, what were you doing? You're out drinking all night you know um and they said that sometimes it's actually more traumatizing for victims to stand up because it's like their their voice isn't heard and i think this is a, a huge problem is that you know it's possibly ignored or maybe it's not worth the the battle or the fight but i mean your voice is important and you know if you feel like you've been in a situation I mean, it's really important to find support. And I know that can be really difficult. And I think having this conversation is also trying to brainstorm how can community provide support for everybody in this? Um, it's, it's really hard. Right, right. Especially, you know, you and I aren't lawyers. We're not judges. I don't know criminal rules of evidence. I don't know when it's okay to name somebody publicly. You know, I'm, we're just, you know, breathwork facilitators. You're a, a student of psychology about to be a licensed therapist. But that doesn't mean that we have the, uh, the skill or wisdom, really, to make decisions like this. Like, I'm very uncomfortable outing people. Um, I'm trying my best to never do it uh, and, and working with others to, like, you know, figure out the right way forward. But, you know, that doesn't mean we're not getting pressure. Uh, and yeah, at times it's sad, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm helping some people with some legal, legal stuff right now. And it's pretty, it's pretty nuts. Like, I don't, I don't like it one bit. I would rather just be developing coursework for the larger community. But apparently, um, the psychedelic elders kind of left us this problem of not dealing with this issue. And it's been an issue for a long time. Um, it's like starting I'm, to all come out now and it's like okay now now what i mean it seems like this is why we're having this conversation because it, it's starting to kind of just psh, shoot out and we're like okay what, what do we do how do we support the community how do we support victims how do we move forward with this and i don't know if it's like creating some sort of ethical board some you know i, I don't know um i think as a community we need to figure this out let's have the conversation let's let's keep working to to develop this talk track um but be really careful as soon as you feel really certain about something please let that sound an alarm for you uh and you know triple check and share with a lot of people please don't be forceful um let's not really you know create another um yeah, I don't want to use those words. Let's just be very careful and considerate and conscious of what we're doing. And um, talk to a lot of folks. Don't just go, oh, okay, Jimmy said this, so therefore that's what happened and this is the story and uh, everything's fine. You know, um, reality is far more complicated than we want to admit. Human memory is far more complicated than we want to admit. When drugs are involved, who knows what's going to happen? Um, doesn't make it okay. But we have to realize that when drugs are in the mix, some bad shit can go down, um, especially when you're partying with multiple substances and God knows what happens. Um, so, yeah, like, and, in, in, you know, I, I've heard of some problematic people out there and had the suggestion, like, why don't we just call the cops and like say, hey, I'm in this community and we have some really strong concerns about individual X, like, um, we've heard X, Y, Z stories. What do you, what do you think we should do? Um, or can you just like go knock on their door and, and talk to them and maybe that'll scare them straight. I don't know if that's the right move, but you know, perhaps it's an option that you consider. Um, 
people are doing unsafe facilitation. Okay, so here's another thing. <laughs> this is probably the last kind of crazy story. Um, <laughs> psychedelics have been used for a long time to manipulate people. You start with MK Ultra, then go down to Jim Jones and Charlie Manson. And those are like extreme cult-like things that were created um, consciously uh, with the help of psychedelics and, and some sort of cult mentor who's very sophisticated with his psychedelic use and use of psychology against people. And um, people have learned those tricks. Some people are just born to understand how to manipulate people like that too. And if you come up like, look at me, I'm the magic man. I got these drugs. I know how to use it. I, you know, I did DMT 1600 times. So therefore I'm, you know, the best expert in the world on, on DMT and spirituality, blah, blah, blah. When in fact, that probably made you a lot more unstable. Um, and borderline personality disorder can pop up. Narcissism, delusions of grandeur, um, general inflation. Um, all that kind of stuff can happen through psychedelic use alone. Not to mention if you're in a group and manipulating people to try to like gain power or influence or whatever it is. So uh, there's folks out there who are still using this method um you'll hear about them once in a while so if you if you see even something that like remotely makes you question someone's motives or behavior look very carefully you know sound the alarm go hey uh is that cool and then you know maybe do some research what does cult behavior look like and dig in um are they saying it's not okay for you to question things to think for yourself, like you have to take their word for it. Like this is the way ayahuasca works. This is the way DMT works. Like, you know, and if you disagree with them, you're in trouble. Mm, that's a red flag to me. In psychedelia, we should be able to question everything. There was this McKenna quote about relentlessly living with unanswered questions. Like the psychedelic life is, you know, relentlessly living in the face of an increasing number of unanswered questions. And I think there's something there. Like. I, for now, at least, like maybe we'll get to a point in the future where we have real answers, but you know, the best we have right now is kind of like a, a decent philosophy of um, life. And uh, you know, these techniques that you're learning in, in school about, you know, how to, how to help people become more healthy. Um, you know, beyond that, I don't know. Like, uh, I don't know any comments on that stuff. Something came up for me when you were talking about this, um, about self care. And Absolutely. that, like, I think all of us are at the risk of possibly making mistakes, messing up, um, you know, just maybe doing things. It, it, we're all at risk. And I think that the fact is that, like, if we're doing this deep inner work a lot of the time, um, we're not doing the work, like, kind of spiritual bypassing. Like, we really need to continue to, like, check in with ourselves and ask, like, are we taking care of ourselves? Are we showing up with integrity? Are we actually helping somebody? Or, you know, because if we're just kind of, you get caught up in these cycles, it, it can sometimes, yeah, turn manic. <laughs> not saying that it happens to everybody, but, you know, it's, it's really important to take care of yourself. Um, yeah. So we've got free, so I guess it, it was, as a way of wrapping this up, like we've got some free courses out there on our Teachable site, psychedelicstoday.teachable.com. What are some of the eight common psychedelic mistakes? Is there, are there some others? Um, there's the spiritual emergence or psychosis webinar mm -hmm. that we have up there. Um, and then we have our navigating psychedelics, but that, that's paid for. Um, and we're going to start making some of that content available for free just to share that out there. Yeah. Um, and, and help even more. Uh, we've got some eBooks on integration and self-care, um, kind of a trip journal too that could really help. So you know, we're we're trying to make resources available to all y'all, and really just hope to um, keep this conversation going. Let's not try to kill each other. Let's not try to put everybody in jail or like you know go on your own crusade. You know, let's let's try to be really authentic about ourselves, like what what our experience is, and 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 be really careful about what our next actions are, um, because our actions have a lot of consequences. At any, it's such a small community that um, 
we need to be really mindful about like what we're doing and why we're doing it and, and how forceful we're being and, and all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, maybe jail is not the right answer. Maybe delicensing somebody isn't the right answer or, um, you know, there's these concepts around restorative justice or like various social process technologies. I think that's what's like a, a world cafe to discuss these issues as a group. So yeah, just Google world cafe. It's really fascinating, free and simple. And uh, it's a great way to do group facilitation around ideas like this and issues like this. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, this recording I did recently with Britta Love, who is a panelist at the um, Dismantling Patriarchy event, Catherine McLean put on. Um, we talked about like, what's the next best use for, for somebody? Like, you know, let's not treat it perpetrators like total garbage. Like maybe let's figure out a place for them in the community that's still helpful for the community because um, odds are good. They don't want to leave the community as a whole. They just have to be checked a little more. Um, you know, the same way you don't kill all sex offenders, you actually just kind of label them and say, okay, you now have this special set of constraints on you. Um, it's kind of messed up, but it's, it's also kind of um, better than, you know, throwing them on some Island together to not interact with the rest of humanity. You know, they, they can still hold a job. They can still do a lot of things, but you know, there's rules. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the solution is, but let's just keep talking. Um, yeah. and I, th I think that's important. Just keep talking and kind of checking yourself and also checking in with other people, seeing what other people have to say. And, um, you know, I think, I think that's really important to have somebody like help reflect your experience back to you and really kind of have a lot of self-awareness around what's going on for you. Um, you know, and just to kind of reflect on my personal experience. I mean, there was a time when I was working in like residential where I was so burnt out, <laughs> you know, I was, and when I was like showing up for the clients or the, um, the people that I was working for, like, I felt like I knew, I knew I was burnt out and had to take a step back. It's like, I can't show up authentically and help these people, <laughs> you know, like I really need to just take a step back and take care of myself. So yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I really want to stress the importance of that, of like having self-awareness, cultivating it, knowing when to step up, know when to step back um, and when to like, yeah, just take care of yourself. And, you know, I think it's also, you know, important to obviously put that out there that, you know, we're both white men and um, we might have a limited view on a lot of this stuff. So, you know, um, I don't know what it's like to be a woman nowadays. I don't know what it's like to, you know, be of a different minority or, or race. Um, so, you know, it's it's important to give us feedback too you know if if we're kind of you know saying things that aren't true like it's important to help us understand because you know there's yeah we're two white dudes we acknowledge it yeah <laughs> um I, I mostly read male authors um i'm trying my best to read a diverse set of authors from all races and genders but it's difficult especially when I'm trying to, you know, read as much about psychedelia as possible. It's, uh, it's tough to, to balance that. Um, the conversation with Britta Love that should come out in a week or two is going to be really interesting. And I think you're all going to like it because it, it is about this topic exactly. And it's an extension on the discussion of the dismantling patriarchy panel. Like there are perpetrators out there. What do we do about it? We, we know some of their names. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a complex topic. So maybe, maybe some homework, have a dinner party, like, or, you know, uh, cheapest option, go have a coffee somewhere with four people and chat about this. Um, they don't have to be people involved in psychedelia. They could be involved in anything from soccer, football to uh, crazy, like, you know, I don't want to call it crazy because that makes it sound bad. <laughs> um, extreme fetish culture or something, you know, like it, because we're both kind of extreme subcultures in a way, um, there's lessons to be shared. Yeah, definitely. And it's so important to understand, like just listen to other people's perspectives from different, um, say subcultures or different populations, you know, and, and this is a huge problem in the yoga community too, uh -huh. you know, and I'm, I don't, I'm not really in that community, but I don't know how they're dealing with some of this stuff, but. You know? It's intense. It's yeah. really intense. And the uh, so I'm I'm 
I played a lot in the occult world, like magic and all that kind of stuff. And that was very serious there too. So this is not just a psychedelic thing. This is like an everywhere thing. Yeah. And, you know, people in these various subcultures are willing to talk and, and share their learned wisdom. And uh, there's even academics working on this issue. There's academics working on the cult issue. So like, there, there's even a, an academic put together like a cult score scorecard. Like, is this a harmful cult or not? <laughs> and uh, he he ran through a lot of um, criteria that would make it so or not, and it's even used by the FBI now. So, um, yeah, stay tuned. We're gonna keep doing more of this stuff, and um, we just want wanted to get out in front of this thing a little bit. I know maybe we're a little late to the party, but you know we're we're thinking carefully about this stuff and how to act, and um, we hope you all do too. All right. So thanks, Kyle. And uh, wrap for now and we'll do it again soon. All right. Thanks, everybody.